podcast. I have Nicole Schweitzer Cartagena, um, a local coach uh, and a, a player who played at NVSC. Um, and she's 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 coached at a very young age. And we're going to talk about the local uh, uh, soccer scene and her trip to the World Cup. Uh, Nicole, uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me. Of course. So, well, first of all, to give a little bio, uh, and the bio won't be long because you're a very young person. Um, mm -hmm. You're from your third generation soccer in this area, I believe, because I know your mother, Marie Orinato, um, had her number retired for Radford, which is a huge yeah. honor. But she's on the first division one program at Radford, I believe. And she played at Lake Braddock. Um, we were, they were awesome um, in those days. And uh, Marie's been a very successful coach. Um, <laughs> she has like this positive coaching alliance. And I want to see how positive she was with, with your career in, in a while. But I think her, her father, your grandfather, was also a coach because I've seen pictures of him coaching too. So tell us a little bit about, about their coaching uh, background. Sure. So my grandpa actually coached my mom's team. My mom started soccer a little late. She was a gymnast and then she was diagnosed with scoliosis. So oh. she couldn't do gymnastics anymore. So she chose soccer. And my grandpa kind of filled that role as coach. Um, and he stuck with it and created this Braddock Road uh, Cougars that were just amazing. They had a great group dynamic. They were very successful and won a lot of championships. Um, moving forward into when she had me, um, she was my coach from U9 to U18. Um, so I had my mother as my coach. Um, and actually, my grandfather, kind of a couple years into it, was t got the role as assistant coach, aka our stat keeper. So you always saw my mom on the sideline, Tim sitting in the chair, recording goals, assists, saves, all that jazz. Um, so it's been really cool that I get the chance to continue that legacy um, as being the third generation coach, and um, I'm loving it. <laughs> so did. Did um did your did your grandfather did he play soccer himself or did he just learn how to coach? Because no, um, so he played soccer as he got older, like in co-ed leagues and stuff like that. Um, when he was younger, he was in the in the military, so kind of did that. Um, and yeah, I think maybe played for fun, yeah. but never like a structured organization for soccer for him. Yeah, so one thing that you're way too young to remember when I was playing soccer, and I didn't play travel, but I. I played like in the late seventies and we all played house. It wasn't like this generation of folks that had played soccer uh, to coach us because soccer was not a huge participant sport uh, back in the, in the fifties and sixties. It was in some parts of the country. So often our coaches were like just somebody's father. Like my, my father yeah. coached one of my house teams. He never even saw a soccer game before he volunteered to coach. So it's, it's interesting um, and a lot of these coaches became really good coaches because they took it seriously. They learned the game. Um, I, I know that the, not the Cougars, but the, the Blue Bells coach um, yeah. can play and he really became, um, you know, a great coach as well. So anyway, so your mother, um, what did you know about your mother's playing career? I mean, I, uh, I lived in Lake Braddock and I knew legend of your mom, but what, what did you heard about your mother's career as you were growing up? So not so much like heard about it. Like I would meet like friends of hers that are in the area, like, and they would be the ones telling me stories. She never really like talked about it too much. She told me like where she played and stuff like that. That was common knowledge. But I remember when I was younger, I found this book and she's going to laugh when I say this, found this book and it had all these patches in it of championships she won. I guess they used to give these little pins as like the medals instead of like uh, awards and it all those were in there and then it would have like little notes about this game this happened and so like I was reading that without her knowing I was reading that so that's honestly where I found um all the information and then my grandmother she always cut out um newspaper clippings if it talked about like their team or Radford anything like that and she, my mom had those in the the journal as well so I that's basically how I learned about it and then when I was born my mom was still playing she actually played for the semi-pro team the Majestics for the first year but then suffered a knee thing right away I remember that clear as day yeah. um so yeah I guess that's kind of how I found out about her soccer playing experiences and you later played for the Majestics yourself and, and she coached the Majestics is that is that right 
Yeah. So um, I was like a junior Majestic. So my parents owned the semi-pro team when it, the W League first started. So their inaugural year, um, they set it up. And so my mom was on that team. And then my dad basically carried on that team until now. It, I think it's in possession of another a club. They sold it. But um, it was really cool growing up having that semi-pro team and then having me as like kind of like the under junior team. You felt really special. <laughs> how, about, how about your father? Was he a soccer player as well? So he played like in high school and stuff like that and like some recreational leagues. He was a goalie. My brother was a goalie. Um, so yeah, he played. And then when I was growing up, he was playing in the co-ed leagues as well. Not anymore. <laughs> so when you were a kid, did you have any choice that if, if you didn't play soccer, you weren't going to eat or were you like forced to play or did you like kind of gravitate when, to what mom and dad were doing? Oh, no, I was like in into soccer before I probably was out the womb um so it was it was my choice uh I just always had a ball with me just kicking around my brother was two years older than me so of course those boys would be scrimmaging and I didn't care how short how young I was I was scrimmaging too and sometimes it'd be me walking off the field crying because I don't know something happened mm -hmm. but I, I love to play so it was definitely my choice <laughs> So you, you mentioned earlier that your your mother coached you. Um, talk about some of the, the the positives and minuses of having your mother coach. I, I assume you have a really good relationship. Is that is that true? Yes, we still have a really good relationship. So um, I really enjoyed having my mother as a coach. I think um, it took some time to kind of establish like the different roles, especially as a young kid. Like there was mom, and then there was Coach Marie. Um, so at a young age, like if I was at the soccer field, it was never mom. It was always coach Marie. Like I had to have the same standard as, as everyone else. Um, the one thing that was probably a little different was like, you're going home on the car rides home with the coach instead of your, your caregiver. So um, of course, like, she's the one who knew like the game plan and all that stuff. So like when we were reflecting, we were reflecting hard and I was very competitive. So kind of the coach and then the really competitive player on those way home, sometimes that conversation, it got, it got really intense, but like, it was good. It was never anything that was out of control. Um, and, and we actually talk about it now uh, that we, our soccer IQ probably gained from those conversations um and everyone gets a kick out of it because still to this day if we're coaching together we're at the fields together I say coach Marie and they look at me like why are you saying coach Marie because it's like it's muscle memory <laughs> I just like we're at the soccer field as coach Marie plus you, know, you look like twins so you must be just going to call her mom well, right you know, I know I know a lot of um circumstances where a parent who's a good soccer player they train their kid. So they're, they, you know, they, they do a lot of one-on-one -on -one training with them or, you know, they're kicking with them. They're always with them, but not really coaching. Do you think mm -hmm. it would have been okay for you guys, to, your mom, just to be like your trainer and do the one-on-one -on -one training and you play for someone else? Do you think that would have benefited you at all? Or do you think it was better for uh, Coach Marie uh, to be your coach? I loved having Coach Marie as my coach just because she took it further than just soccer. So like with my team, she created us as like a community and I'm actually still like best friends with about like 10 of the girls on my team. We still go on like trips together and all that stuff. So that extended more from the soccer field than anything else. Uh, but I, I couldn't imagine it any other way. Uh, I had other trainers that I trained with when I wanted those extra touches but she was the one who always, I feel like, understood me the best. And when I guest played with other teams or did a summer league with a different coach, it was always fun. I always learned new things, but it was always good to go back to Coach Marie. <laughs> so you played you played for NBSC? Is that where you played? Yeah, it was mid-county when I was growing up. And then uh, I, I think it was like three or four years into my career with them. we They merged with it was Massa, Manassas Soccer Association, which – made NBSC. Okay. That's and it. you played for your high school as well. Is that correct? Yes, I played at Forest Park. Oh okay. which well, where we coach. <laughs> did could, did Marie coach at Forest Park as well? Not when I was in high school. Okay. So I had two different coaches at, in high school there. And it was was high school important to you, high school soccer, or was club always more important? Uh I would say for me personally, I I enjoyed club more. 
but I loved repping my school. Like, so it was, it was hard to say, like, I enjoyed club with like the going on to tournaments and going to training and seeing people like I've been comfortable with for years, high school. I mean, freshman, sophomore year, intimidating, of course, because you're going in with the older girls trying to make a name for yourself. Um, uh, senior year, my favorite year ever, of course, like you're, you're the senior of the team, you have leadership roles, you're trying to just have a really good time. And uh, my coach, Mr. Malloy, he made a great experience for me my senior year. So yeah, I guess uh, it's a little both. I can't really, I would say my club a little bit more, but yeah, high school is up there. Were, there, were, were the things about high school that developed you as a player that you'd even recommend your club players to to play with the high school now? Uh, I would say it depends how, like, I think everybody should do whatever they feel is best for them. So if you feel like it's a little too much to join the high school team, that's okay. It, no one should be discouraging you. Um, but if you feel like, hey, like I really wanna join this team, they're the best. Or, hey, I wanna join this team because I know I can have a leadership role on this team instead of just being a player. Like they're not as great, but like this will develop me in a different way that I, I don't have with my club team. Um, so in those situations, I definitely think it's the player's choice. Um, I hope there's no external uh, factors from coaches or parents, you know, that can happen. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's a lot. You never know. A really good soccer player can be a really good person at music too. So it's how do you balance out all those things? Yeah, one thing I love about high school is if you look at Prince William County last year, the year before last on the boys side, you had Benji Velasquez playing for Garfield. You had Fernando playing for, I think he was Potomac, but then you had Cooper over at Osborne. She had all these players who play different positions in club and now for college. For, for, uh, for the high school, though, they're always almost in, a, in a, either a midfield or a scoring position. They have to take more leadership in terms of the offense. So it's, it's fun when you have these players from different clubs and they go to their high school and they're kind of trying to build their high school around, around their own talents and they play against the other high school. Yeah, it's definitely a confidence booster too. Like being able to play on a stadium – you doing something that impacts your team in a positive way, like that's an unreal feeling. Looking at the stands, you have friends there, you have uh, caregivers, you have all of these people just cheering you on, and it's pretty cool. It's a nice experience. What did you think about the the Colgan team for last year? Now, Samantha de Guzman is unbelievable. When I look at the <laughs> play, the way she dribbles and the way she shoots, and she's got she's fearless. But then they had, and, I, and I'm I think her name is Cami. They had the right back that's amazing as well. He has so much talent. Isn't it awesome that all these great players are choosing to play for the high school team? Oh, yeah. I know our first game uh, against Colgan, my mom and I looked at the field and we're like, whoop, they got all ECNL players on their starting lineup. And I think we had one, um, one or two, maybe two. Um, but but it's just it's great. Like it makes the competition that much better for all of the girls in general and playing high school is just like an experience that you'll never forget. At, at least they'll have a year of doing that, even if they decide not to do it another year. Um, I, I thought it was great. Colgan is an unreal group. Um, we've coached many of those players uh, as they were younger. So we did have that advantage the first game because we did pull the upset. Um, but then, uh, of course, they came back because they're very good. <laughs> But that was our only loss of the year, isn't that right? Yeah, we did it. <laughs> it's amazing. Our team, our team played amazing. I'm so proud of them for that one. Yeah. It's a whole team effort for yeah. sure. Well, when you when you think about Prince Prince William County, um, you know it's it's heavily Latino now in the eastern portion of the county, and I think you're kind of like in the central part of the county. Um, but there's but on the boys' side, like uh, my son played for Alexandria. And he, of, of his 20 players on his team, probably 15 were, were Spanish first kids. Mm -hmm. And, but on the girls team in the same age group, uh, on the girls club, there would be maybe, maybe one Latina girl playing and the rest would be, you know, white girls. Maybe, maybe a couple of uh, African girls would be playing, not African-Americans, but African girls would be playing. But it was, it was, it was a different dynamic on the girl side than it was on the boy side. How is it in Prince William now? And you have a, you have you have, you have a large Latino population. Are the Latina are the girls beginning to play soccer as well? Oh yeah, one hundred and ten percent. So the diversity in Prince William County, as you know, is huge, and um, 
it's been it's been really cool to see as the world grows with the game so does it in these smaller communities you have no idea the impact it has we had a player who was moroccan you know the moroccan women's team they're just developing and getting pretty good right um never played soccer ball before came out to play and did amazing so it's really cool to see something like that and then to see players that we've coached that are very very talented um, from the Latina community, getting opportunities, not just to play for their club in their high school, getting to go to their countries and actually represent their national team. So three players we've coached have gotten to go to El Salvador to play for their um, under 20 national, under 17 national team. Um, a girl from Forest Park went to Panama uh, to go play. I had a player of mine who um, actually didn't go to Latina, went to the Caribbean, uh, she she was on my U9 and U10 team. She just represented Jamaica. And I'm like, this is the these opportunities that were not there when we were younger as much. I mean, maybe there were a few. I won't say nobody, but it's so cool to see. And I think even other girls seeing some of their classmates and stuff doing these things, they might be like, hey, can I play rec? Like just starting it up, really starting the process. I, I even go out to the field sometimes and it's like, a bunch of kids kicking around and you'll see like just girls that probably never played soccer before out there with the boys, just having a good time trying to kick it around and learn from them. So it's really fun to see. I definitely think it's growing in this community for sure. Yeah, it's exciting to see. I, I definitely think it was more of a boys thing 15 years ago. And I'm glad to see that the girls are, are, are playing as well. So look, I, I know you, you went to Virginia Tech. Um, mm -hmm. I did Google you uh, on YouTube and I got to see some of your highlights of when you played. And you had a nice left <laughs> foot, you had a lot of nice, you were a very good passer. Look, you played on the on the, the left back or the midfield most of the time. Is that is that right? I was center mid most of the time. Um, so I could go anywhere. I just wanted to play. So wherever I got to go, I played. <laughs> yeah, but it was obvious you were a really good player. Um, so, but you probably, I, th I think you decided not to play college soccer, but obviously you could play division three if you wanted to. So what, yeah, so what I did actually initially sign in. I went to um, a division three program okay. in, New in Newport News. Um, unfortunately, kind of like Mallory Pugh, I had a well, one week after preseason. So got through the hardest part. And then we were just at training and I felt a little sore and I went to the doctor and I was like, Hey, like, I think I need to be stretching. And they're like, no, like you need to go get this checked out. So I had torn my patella tendon mm -hmm. and I, it was just slight. It wasn't the whole. Um, so it was one of those things, give or take, you can get the surgery or you don't have to. And I opted out and it, and it was one of those things that just kind of was like a waiting game. Cause you don't know how long that's going to take progressively to heal and ultimately, it was the right thing for me to do because I was in the wrong major at that school. I didn't, for me, I'm a social person. So I like to meet people all the time. And it was just a smaller school. Um, and then I'm a homebody. So I miss like home and seeing people that I knew from home. There wasn't many people that went there that came from um, where I was from. Um, so I ended up transferring to tech. My brother was there. So that was part of my home. I got to go into a field of like human development, working with people, the study of people. So could go into any career with people I wanted to do. Um, and then uh, it was just a great big school. I got to play like intramurals clubs and all that stuff. So there's still soccer opportunities without playing on the team. <laughs> well, did you, did you know that you were going to be a coach um, when you're in college? Um, so I... <laughs> I don't know. I was coaching when I was like little for my mom's camps. Like I was always on the U4s, U5s, like as a middle school, high schooler. So I always had it in me already. And then if my mom had another team, I was watching, you know, trying to, I was tagging along and seeing what she was doing. Um, so I think it was always known that I'd probably go into it, um, the extent of it. Um, I don't know if I knew how far it would get and where where I would be now with everything, but I'm I'm I think I knew. <laughs> well, it looks like you got into teaching as well. Yeah, so you get a teacher yes. and you you got a job in Prince in Prince William County. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us how that happened. So um, when I finished college, I had to do an internship for my degree in human development and I chose occupational therapy. 
And it was within the school system. So I was shadowing an occupational therapist going from class to class to class. And we went to this one class and it was a Head Start class. And I've never heard of Head Start like growing up. And it was preschool. It was four and five-year-olds. They were so cute. Um, It's a lot of inclusion-based kids with risk factors. They could be residing under poverty, all that stuff. And I was like, okay, I don't want to do occupational therapy. I want to be a Head Start teacher. I was like, this looks amazing. So that's what I ended up doing. And right after my internship, I got my career in that. And then I went and got my master's simultaneously in early childhood education. So just that's been my career thus far. However, I still have this human development background. So now I'm doing like more than just teaching. I'm teaching um, all adolescents mental fitness and all that stuff. So that's my new my new teaching that's outside of the school system. Okay, but you're but you're physically located at a school though. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm I'm in uh, Prince William County at a um, Washington Reed Elementary. Okay. So. Um... And so you have, you have, but you have plenty of time to coach. It doesn't really interfere with your club and your high school coaching. Yeah. So um, right now for my uh, like club coaching journey, I am doing more so the mental side of it. So I'm, I'm not on the sidelines. Uh, actually, I'm just going in and helping teams with like mental fitness. So that could be mindset, team building, resilience, training, all of that, because we now know that research base that that is just as important as developing those technical skills. And since I have the background, it's been really fun to get to do that for teams. Um, and then for the high school, it does not affect my high school because it's literally, I think, five minutes down the street from my high school. So I leave and I go to practice. <laughs> yeah. I, I interviewed a guy named Mike Singleton. Mike is the head coach at Washington Lake College. And okay, I always successful. He's a psychi- psychiatrist. So mm-hmm. I, I got a sports psychiatrist and I, and I asked him, maybe just a psychiatrist. And I asked him whether that helps you're going to be an effective coach because he's been killing them. And he yeah. said, yes. and I think the thing was when I played sports, you went to see a psychiatrist when you're missing too many layups and you were <laughs> now psychiatry is seen as more positive and part of the process. It's not, right. when you're up, it's how can we maximize all our talent? So it's, it's more of a, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. It could be a positive thing now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We, we come in prior to any issues like that. It's training the mind to um, be able to have strategies and techniques in place when things do come up. So um, a lot of people learn these things through experiences. I mean, you learn resilience when you're going through adversity, but do you really know at uh, when you're a kid what resilience is? No, that, that's just a big word for you. Um, but kind of doing hands-on things that gets you to remember um, what it could be and what you could do or help, how you could help your teammates through it um, is so helpful. Um, and then like respect. Like I know a lot of teams want that involved in their culture, like respecting the culture club respecting um their teammates and stuff like that because it makes a huge difference i mean you saw late in the news about mbappe disrespecting his teammates and that was a huge thing that took away from the team's success and hopefully they're going through it right now with the therapy stuff um to bring them back into being a whole unit so it's so important i can't talk about it enough i could keep going (laughs) well do you enjoy that more than being a head coach on the sidelines and picking your lineup or training your team for a game, picking your lineup, game coaching. Do you enjoy that side of it more than actually being a, being a head coach? I think so. I think so. And it's, it's new. So like, I'm really eager and hungry. Like I've been doing it for two years now uh, to, to continue doing it. Um, but yeah, I think I like it a little more. I like being, I mean, it's so fun to be a coach and set your lineup and be part of the team's success in that way. Cause you're at the forefront but then also, like, I want to kind of be in the background. I want to see the things that people overlook. Like, if I know somebody is struggling and I'm, like, watching them from the sidelines instead of being, like, there, we need to do this, 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 and seeing them go through something successful, maybe we've been working on it, it would mean so much more than oh, a win on the sideline as a coach. So, in a way, you'd rather be, like, a consultant for 10 teams than a head coach for one or two teams. 
Oh, a hundred percent. I think the more people I can positively impact is the, is better for me. Cause when, when I impact someone in a positive way, it helps me in my mental health and my mental headspace. It's, it's one of those things that makes me feel good. It fuels my fire. <laughs> Would you want to do that, um, you know, full time? Would you want to be like a, a, a person who consults with pro teams or with college teams? Is that something you would right. like? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I have, I have started my own business. So I, I do run my business is the MJX mental fitness. And so that's how I've been getting to go to different clubs or individuals or running camps, clinics, things like that. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm sitting on a, uh, sitting on an idea that could just be so much more and it could go so many different directions. And anytime I talk about it with someone like, yeah, their eyebrows are raised. They're like, yeah, it's so needed. And I mean, I can only extend myself so far. So of course I'll look for people that are just as passionate as me and just continue to growing to help everybody. Yeah, I, I think it's something that's needed. One thing I realized about soccer, um, cause I didn't play, uh, my son um, was a you know, pretty solid player for, for Yorktown. Right. And um, every, Every coach sees players radically different in soccer. If you took five great coaches and you put like 10, 10 players in front of them, they would rank the players radically different. Um, soccer is one of those sports where everyone sees something different. They, they have a different vision for what they see. And it's it's a problem. And that, it's not a problem, but it's a challenge because I think certain players are really underappreciated in, in certain circumstances. I would think someone in your role might be able to help coaches maximize all their plays, especially if the coach can build up a, if you can build up a trust with the coach that you're only here to help. I'm not here to get the kids to play the way I, I want, I want them to play. You're the coach. I want to help their mental fitness to make them, make them more useful to you. Right. And there's a lot of moments in games that go overlooked because maybe your eyes are just as a coach following the play, which is so normal. Right. So basically my, my role in that would be to look for those other moments. Um, and a prime example with that, like in a team atmosphere could be like what happens after something disappointing. So say your team gets scored on, are, are we doing the blame game or do we have collective responsibility in that moment? Are you winning together, losing together? Or after the game, is there some bickering going on? The coach doesn't know because he's saying good game to the other coach. But I'm, my ears are like <laughs> listening in to seeing what's happening, those those responses. So I think it's so needed. I mean, it only helps the team because um, it's just prepping for moments like that. Because are you going to win every game? Absolutely not. So uh, that's just one prime example. But I, I totally think it's something that's needed throughout the community. Do you think a lot of coaches uh, hurt the mental out outlook of their players, the way they handle their players? Um, I think that, well, so in coaching, so when we're getting our licensures, there's a lot of pressure on the way we do it, like the the organizational aspect, the, the um, lineups, the lesson plans, the templates, um, really pressuring the issue of tactical, technical, all that kind of stuff. So when your brain is filled with all of that, it's totally fair that some of those things get unnoticed. And when they get unnoticed, that's really where sometimes it hurts the team, you know, um, and it will, it will create that divide. So I, it's understandable. I, kn I know there's probably some coaches out there that are really like press and press and press and where it's, it's hurting the team. You shouldn't be acting like that. Um, but I, I can, I can understand how some coaches might not have these tools in their toolbox to press the issue of mental fitness. And that's also something I've, kind of been starting to do too is doing activities that I send to coaches to do like 10 or 15 minutes before or after their training se session to teach the coaches how to teach mental fitness. So it could be a game. It could be like um, they share like goals that they want to um, accomplish this year. That way they're all coming together and they have one common goal that they want to accomplish by the end of the year. And that's just huge. Like, you don't normally do that. Like I, I know, cause I did all the coaching courses. So I, I know that that's not the typical lesson plan. I never said, oh, we need to do a goal, a smart goal sheet. 
and come up with goals. That was never there. Right. Well, I'll make sure I'll leave your contact information and web website and all that stuff below so folks can get in touch. You're a very positive person. So thank you. I'm sure you'll be fantastic at that. I want to talk a little bit about the World Cup. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> now, you set a record for fair weather fans because <laughs> not moments, 10 minutes after the USA women's loss in the World, World Cup, you show up on my Facebook feed with the Australian national jersey on. And I'm like, we just, I said, we just lost Nicole, uh, you know, in, you know, in, in 10 minutes. So anyway, uh, I'm just teasing. I know your, your husband's Australian, I believe. Is that right? He, his grandparents, you know, he's El Salvadorian, but his grandparents live in Australia because there was some civil unrest. So they got to go to Australia from El Salvador. Okay. That's how right. we got so, it. <laughs> you had a reason to have that Australian yes. jersey. <laughs> But uh, well, tell us a tell us a little bit about your trip to uh, to Australia, and I'm I'm really interested to hear uh, how the Australians are accepting soccer. Now I follow some Australian soccer players on Instagram, and I got the feeling this was a big coming out moment for Australia that the women soccer game wasn't really appreciated as much as it is, and because the Aussies don't love soccer like they love their own Australian rules football and stuff. But yeah, talk a little bit about your trip and. And, and how Australia is, is warming to soccer. Sure. So like as soon as we got there, of course, and I went to the France World Cup too, so I can, I can compare and contrast the differences. Like in France, like we got there and it was kind of like propaganda places and like seeing ads and stuff like that, but not not a lot. Um, like they sold out of food at the, the, the games because they didn't expect that many fans for a women's game. So four years later, I get to go to this World Cup and I'm telling my husband, I was like, okay, like brace yourself. We might not get like any merchandise or anything like that. Completely blew my mind out of the park. So they had stuff everywhere, billboards at the airport. They had fan zones, just like they do at the men's World Cup, where even if you weren't at the, the games, you could go watch the other games at these fan zones and really get involved with the crowd and support a team. Um, if you wanted to do that, like free face painting, all, all this fun stuff, right? Um, but with the Australian culture, um, and it's funny because I was talking to a lot of people, these fan zones had it and like some places had it on the TV, but it's not normal. Like women's games are not streamed typically. And like we went to a sports bar to like watch a game and we asked her, like, can you change it to the channel? They're like, oh, no, we didn't. We decided not to buy that channel. And I was like, I couldn't wrap my hand around it because, like, coming from America where you could go any direction and go watch a game, um, it was just so different. But then as I saw Australia's success, I saw Australia's, like, love for the game come out and everybody, like, w the game I saw for Australia at the Olympic Park sold out. The atmosphere around the stadium was insane. Like I've never been to a game, even for the United States, that had that atmosphere. And I think it just, it really just skyrocketed based on like it being there, their success. And maybe seeing like other fans from other countries come in, like representing in then Australia, people like, oh, we got to keep up. <laughs> so, so it was incredible. Oh, that, that's great. I wish I could have been there. So what, what were your thoughts on the U.S. team? I know... Um, it was a very disappointing World Cup, and I I felt like we didn't really play well until the last game, and, and yeah. in the last game we weren't able to get um, the ball in the back of the net. But what were your what were your thoughts about the U.S. team? Well, first and foremost, I want to uh, take some accountability because the only like the games the two games we went to they didn't score a goal, so maybe it was me. Maybe I was the bad luck. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> other than that, it was just a different atmosphere with the group. I felt like personally that it wasn't as um, dynamic. They weren't like as um, cohesive together as in the past. Um, leadership roles, did I see much of that? Um, not so much because I, I stuck around, you know, I was the first one in my seat and then I stuck around after the game to see what the response was because that's what I do. Like, I like to see that stuff. Um, so like even when, in the moment when we were at the Portugal game, like, and everybody left, I'm watching, the coach just left, a few players left, and then I see Kelly O'Hara, like, losing her mind, like, definitely trying to, like, reel in the team, so 
I saw on the mental side of things, it was a little a disconnect compared to the France World Cup, but I also saw them play when they were winning and successful. So of course there's that excitement. Um, I think that we have so much potential and I think we are a great group. And I think the rest of the world is becoming very, very good. So competition makes it that much harder. The high expectations for the U.S. team are hard to fulfill, right? But I can I can see us coming back from it and being resilient. I mean, this is only going to make them stronger and work harder. I mean, it, it would for me. <laughs> well, since you, you're into the mental aspect, uh, so Megan Rapino, yeah. uh, uh, you know, after she missed the penalty kick, um, she she kind of smiled. Mm -hmm. She got torched on um, yeah. Twitter or whatever, social media. And, you know, everyone deals with heartbreak and disappointment differently. You, you do things when you're kind of nervous or you're upset. You react. Everyone has a different way of reacting. And I, I felt like people just were piling on because yeah. they don't like her personally. And mm -hmm. some people, but what, what, how did you feel about that reaction? Maybe you didn't notice, but, um, but did you? Yeah, I noticed. It, it's definitely a self-regulation technique that probably started when she was younger and is more so a habit than anything else. Um, I know me, I'm a big smiler. So like when I played soccer, like if I made a mistake, sometimes I would smile, but I, you saw me working hard back to get the ball back. But it's like that, that nervousness kind of. Um, but for her, like, I mean, that's, that's a moment that she just had to get through. And if that's that quick little, uh, like, uh, like smile is what got her through it. I mean, it's, it's life. Um, I don't think she deserves to be ripped apart from it. Um, I don't think anyone deserves to ever be ripped apart for something unless they do something completely wrong to somebody else. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that was just one of her self-regulation strategies. I mean, each player that took them was different. I mean, you saw, um, uh, oh my gosh, I almost lost her name. Oh, ah, the one who met Sophia Smith. Okay. She right away was like, oh my, yeah. like, you saw that, like that was, that was well known. Um, that disappointment, that's a normal reaction to miss it. Someone else did something different. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's very tough. Well, you know, if you don't want to comment on, on the next topic, uh, it's fine. But what was your reaction to the very awkward and, um, possibly criminal, um, uh, moment when this, the head of the Spanish soccer just decided to kiss the captain on the lips. Now, I think a lot of America, at first it was like so shocking that maybe we thought oh, maybe he kisses her all the time. I don't know. But what was your reaction to it? It, it, it was, it was, it was very uh, unsettling to say the least. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was watching the game and I noticed it right away and I looked at Carlos and I was like, Oh, there goes another thing for the Spanish Fed Federation to deal with. I like instantly knew because I was like, nobody should be touching someone like that. Like without like consent or like, I don't know. Um, so I, I saw it right away. For me, I think everything happens for a reason. And with the Spanish team, I know they were going through a lot of trauma and a lot of other things that were mentally affecting them. And so when that moment happened, as, as bad as it was, and to see like the community get behind them, um, it ultimately has made other decisions for that squad to go into place. And um, like the, the team members that do support these decisions are like very, very happy. And it's going to, and it's going to help build that confidence of the team. I mean, they're already on top with their soccer performance, but like the collectivity of the group now, like to feel like their voices are finally heard is just like huge for them. So yeah, because they made a lot of decisions with the coaching staff and that person in particular um, that has the group is feeling happy about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, what is it about women's soccer and, and maybe youth girl soccer as well? We seem to have a lot of issues with that. It, it sometimes it's 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 mental just abuse in terms of coaches are too tough on their players. Sometimes it's it's even darker than that, unfortunately. But there 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 has been a lot of things that have affected women's soccer. When you when you when you think about that, do you think it's more likely just society and these things um, for, for some reason in soccer 
they, they just tend to manifest and we see them? Or do you think there's something going on with women's soccer that it needs some reform? Yeah, I'm I'm not too sure. I mean, I will always support um, players that are in these uh, situations that they don't feel is right if it's ultimately not right. Um, so I I I don't know, I don't know what why it's so present in this moment because multiple clubs across the United States at the highest level have had some of these issues. I mean, our local team have has had this issue, so I. I don't know. We're not there. So I don't really know exactly things that are going on. We're not a part of that case or that process. So I can't speak on that. Um, but I do, I do feel like the the players that are at the high level that can, can show their concerns on a public platform and it goes viral will definitely encourage somebody else to come forward with saying something is happening in their situations. Do we think that this has happened in the past? Probably. I mean, it's probably happened in the men's game too. Um, how they take it, how they perceive things is probably different. What is the right way and wrong way to, to come off as a coach? It's not written in a script. There's no, there's nothing that says this is what you can say as a coach and this is what you can't say. If there was, then then there you go. So, I mean, I'm definitely on the side of things um, of supporting when people are in the wrong and then just standing by people that are victims and helping them through it. But like, yeah, I'm not too sure why it's so present in this moment. Yeah. And, you know, you know, the men's, the men's side has, has its struggles as well. There's a, there's a, there's a great legendary coach that had to step down recently on the men's side. So you know, yeah. it's affecting the game. Um, hey, look, this, this has been great. Uh, Nicole, uh, last question for you. What what do you uh, what do you think about this year's Forest Park team? Are you guys do you guys have some young players coming back? Um, coming oh yeah, back? so we lost a lot of seniors. So we are coming in young, and which is awesome. I mean, I love having the the young team. Um, but it's gonna be it's gonna be so much fun. You know, I have a great time with them. I think that they're gonna just come in with a lot of excitement and confidence because like. Most of our starting lineup was seniors. So there's a lot of opportunities for players to take on these roles. And I'm interested to see who steps up where. And it might be this game here, this game there. Um, but I'm super excited to see the group. I know they're just as excited. They're counting down the days, even though it's so early to, for the season to start. Oh, so and during the high school season, you do coach uh, as an assistant coach. You're not doing just the mental aspect you're, you're right yes I actually am I'm doing training sessions and on the sideline with the girls <laughs> if, if uh coach Marie ever decides to step down retire would you would you ever want to be the head coach of sports park um no I'd probably I'd probably get asked to do it of course I don't see her stepping down though no, no, I'm, like, I'm, not, not gonna stop. <laughs> I'm not pushing her out we, we love coach Marie I was just curious because <laughs> you, you spent uh uh, not half your life there, but quite quite a lot of time there. But look, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Last year, last year was my 10 year uh, from graduating high school, so it was cool to be back 10 years later. Yeah. Well, Nicole, tell us the name of your business again. It's MJX Mental Fitness, actually named after Majestics MJX. It's when I felt the most empowered as an individual in a community, so I thought it was a great name to have for my brand for mental fitness, so it's MJX Mental Fitness. That's a great name. So well, best of luck with it. Maybe we'll have you on again and we can talk more about your business. And oh, yeah. But definitely, I'll, I'll make sure folks can 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 find you. Uh, this has been great. You're, you're such a uh, delight to talk to. you got great personality. And I'm sure you're going to be wildly successful in your business and, and, your, and, your, and your coaching teams if you decide to stick with that as well. And not, and not <laughs> just, on, just on the mental. So, yes. Yeah. But anyway, look, uh, Nicole, thanks again for doing this. No problem. Thanks for having me. Of course. We'll be in touch. All right. Bye. Bye.